Hey guys, welcome back to another Design Clips. Today we're going to be focusing on watercolor again, but this time we're going to be applying that watercolor to our main images. Now, I am not a professional watercolorist. I've only been doing this for about a year, so I'm going to show you how I approach it. There's millions of different ways to do this. We're going to be using our newest uh, Flora and Fauna 2 stamp set to do this, and this is a great set for this because they're all outlined images. So like I said, today we're going to be focusing on the technique of watercoloring your images. So we're not making a complete card. I'm just going to show you how to uh, achieve this look and get similar results. We'll start by stamping all of our images in a water-soluble ink onto watercolor paper. Here I'm using Tim Holtz Distress Ink and Antique Linen. Now you want it to be extremely light ink. The reason we want it to be light is because we don't want that image to show through our final result. We want it to look like we hand painted this, but we want it dark enough that we can see it so we can use that stamp as a guide. We'll be using a mix of traditional watercolors and Tim Holtz Distress Markers. Now, I like using these together because um, the tip on the Distress Markers allows you to really get in there with some detail that, um, especially if you're a beginner, it may be difficult to achieve with a paintbrush. Now this flower is actually a cluster of several tiny flowers. So to color that in, I'm going to begin by putting color down toward the base of the flower, toward the base of the petals around the center. And then I'm going to come in with a damp paintbrush and start spreading that around. Now this is a technique that I um, explained in depth in another video called Fresh Cut Watercolors. So if you haven't seen that one, I'll provide a link down in the description box. But basically you want to just spread that color out now. If your color, if you're losing your color or you're losing control of it, uh, take some of the water off of your brush. You just want a damp brush. You can do this by either squeezing the water out with your fingertips or by touching the base of the brush to a paper towel. You can see here that I'm not uh, re-wetting my brush very often. I'm just using whatever little moisture is left in that brush. I'm going to leave the centers white because we do want to come in and add some yellow or orange to those to indicate the flower centers. You can see I'm not being overly precise. I'm just spreading out that color. By nature, we are quite arrogant um, and our brains will, we, we don't like not knowing something. So our brain will automatically start filling in details. So if we see something that looks similar to a flower, we will start seeing detail that isn't even really there. This is kind of how we can pick shapes out of clouds in the sky. And then we're also very suggestive. So if somebody points out that this looks like something, all of a sudden our brain wants to agree and wants to be right and doesn't want somebody to know more than them. So they're like, oh yeah, that I see that. So it's the same concept kind of applies here. Um, even though we're not drawing petals or drawing defined flowers, our mind will fill in the rest. So all you have to do is add the suggestion. I'm just going to speed things up here while I continue to alternate between laying down color and spreading it out with the water. As this goes, you'll be able to quickly start to see these flowers taking shape. Even though I'm not drawing flowers, I'm basically just laying down color and spreading it out. Once I've got all the flowers filled in, I'm going to take a step take a step back and look at it. And where I can see a petal jumping out at me or a flower jumping out, I'm going to help define that by adding a little bit more uh, purple or sometimes I'll use a little bit of the pink and just help make those petals pop. Now I can come in and add my flower centers. For that I'm using spiced marmalade. And I'm just putting the tiniest little dot right in the center. Now because we're not using much water and this isn't very wet, I can go ahead and do this right away. I don't have much drying time in between. And again, I'm going to come in and just soften some of those centers out. I'll leave some of them hard and soften out the rest. To do the stem, I'll be using Forest Moss Distress Marker, and I'm just going to start by lining one side of the stem. Now these stems are a little bit thicker, but since I'm going to be using the water to spread it out, I really only need to make a line down one side of the stem. I'm also going to add a couple little flicks in between the flowers, um, just to suggest that the stems are up in the top area too, even though you can't really see them. Just that little bit of green showing through is going to help a lot in making these look connected. And then again, just soften it out with the paintbrush. This is where we'll thicken up those stems, and because we only added the color on the one side, it's going to give the illusion that it's more three-dimensional. One side will be lighter, and the other side will be a little darker. Now 
And then while the paper is still damp, I'm going to come in and add just a touch more color to those edges again. And then just soften them out ever so slightly. You don't want it to be one long continuous line or the same color all the way down. You want some variation. So to color the hummingbird, we're going to start with a very light wash of traditional watercolor. I'm going to wet the whole body of the bird except for the wings and the tail feathers and then I'm going to start dropping in my color. Now the reason I want to start with the traditional watercolor as my base is because I want to paint this in several layers. So I want to paint a layer, let it dry, and then add another layer and let it dry. And traditional watercolors are perfect for this. Um, they're made to be painted in washes. So they dry beautifully and they'll still um, blend beautifully. However, I've, dis I've discovered with the Distress Inks that that's not the case. Um, once you lay down a color and it dries, if you go to lay another color on top, um, once that paper gets wet, the old color wants to run from the water. So you don't get that nice smooth blend or you don't get that other color layered on top of the original color. So we're going to get around that by laying down a wash of watercolor first and then coming in and adding the detail with our distress markers. So for each bird, I'm going to lay down my base color in the key areas and then let the water spread it out into the other areas. Now this is going to look atrocious at this point and you're going to want to keep fiddling with it. Don't do it. Just let it dry because you can always come back and add more later. So just let that dry and see what happens. So now I'm going to move over to the other bird and I'm going to wet his whole body and then I'm going to again start dropping in my color. Now the wonderful thing about hummingbirds, I've looked at hundreds of pictures of them now and um, I think they color they come in every single freaking color. I mean you can't choose a wrong color palette for a hummingbird. I've seen them from these vibrant almost iridescent colors to these nice neutral earth tones. So really, you can be as creative as you want with these. As long as the hummingbird is the right shape, um, it's going to be recognizable as a hummingbird. So just have fun with it. Now you'll see that I'm not painting the entire bird with this heavy saturated color. I'm starting off very light and I'm dropping my color in the places where it would be darkest. So where the wing meets the uh, body here, I guess what would be our shoulder. I just dropped a concentrated amount of color there and now the water will carry that color out to the rest of the wing but it'll get lighter as it goes there. So it's already establishing my shadows for me. Now I'm going to move to the other hummingbird and I'm going to start dropping some green in there. Now you can see that the color is still blending with the blue so that paper is still wet so I don't have to do very much. I'll just drop a drop of that green in there and I'm going to leave them alone and then I'm going to move over to the other hummingbird and I'm going to drop a little bit of purple in her throat and on her head. Again, you're going to be tempted to want to move this around because it doesn't look very pretty right now, but just trust me, just drop it and leave it. I'm going to keep alternating back and forth between these birds until I get all of my base color established. I'm going to go ahead and speed things up while I finish laying down that base coat. And remember, I'm working in very light washes here. I'm not trying to achieve any detail at this point. As soon as this is all done and it's all dry, I'll come in with the Distress Inks and a paintbrush and I'll add those details in. You'll also notice that I'm jumping back and forth from bird to bird and that's because I want to give each layer that I lay down a little bit of time to dry. I don't want it to dry completely, but I want to give it time so that the paper is still moist but it's not soaking wet. This will allow each layer to continue to blend into each other and be very soft and I won't end up with any hard lines. At this point I'll stop and I'll let this layer dry completely. To add the feathers we're going to use the same technique as we used on the flowers. We're going to lay down color and then we're going to use a very very slightly damp paintbrush to soften that out. Now a hummingbird's feathers are very similar to like a fish scale look. Um, there are feathers but they are in almost a fish scale pattern. So I'm going to lay down these little half moon shapes and I'm going to stagger them underneath each other. And then I'm going to take a number zero round paintbrush. Again, it's going to be just slightly damp and I'm going to soften out the bottom edge of each of those little half moons. Sorry, I'm going off camera here. Um, I didn't want to get my head in the way and I was pulling it closer to me, but you'll be able to see here, I'm getting ready to do the throat as well. And you'll be able to see this better. 
again, I'm going to lay down those little half moons and I'm not going to do the whole thing. I, I don't want um, any discernible pattern to start showing up. So I'm kind of doing it in um, little groupings of areas, but not covering the whole bird. You do want to use a light hand here. You don't want a big heavy line. And you definitely want to make sure that you don't have too much water on your brush. You want just enough to start moving that ink, but not so much that it all starts to bleed together and you lose what detail you are trying to achieve. I'm going to keep doing this for the entire bird, laying down those half circles and then softening them out. Now, if I say that something is easy, um, I will tell you guys it's easy. This is not difficult but it's not easy it's um it's tedious but it is very relaxing and um if you enjoy coloring with copics or painting in general then you will like this technique and the more you try it the more you practice it the easier it'll get and the faster you'll get and the results are amazing and i think it's worth every minute and every tedious little brush stroke so if you like painting and you like coloring then i definitely suggest that you try this you can add a little shadow under the belly by using weathered wood. Um, it's a really good grayish bluish color, so it's great for doing shadows and it's also the color that we're going to use on the wings. And to do those, we're just going to do the same method as we've been doing for the flowers and the detail of the bird feathers. Um, lay down some color and then smooth it out with the damp paintbrush. I usually like to make uh, them a little bit darker at the tips and a little bit darker at the um, start of the wing feather and then kind of blend them together. I just repeated all of the same steps for the other hummingbird and for the sake of time we're going to go into fast motion just so you guys can watch how it you know all comes together and I will put on a little bit of music in the background for you. All that's left are the eyes and the beaks, and to do those, you'll want to use a dark color. Uh, black soot, Distress Ink is great. I'm using Payne's Gray. You could also use a really deep brown. That would work as well. You'll want to use a really fine paintbrush. I am using the number zero round brush here, and now I'm just following the stamp. Um, since we stamped that, we have our guide. Just do a straight line for the beak, and then do little circles for the eyes. So there you have just one method for watercoloring these images. Now this particular method is more detailed, more tedious, a little more time consuming, but the results are worth it. And trust me, with a little bit of patience and a little bit of practice, it's definitely doable. I really hope that you guys enjoyed today's video and I hope that you give it a try. If you do, tag me on Instagram with hashtag W plus nine. I would love to see what you guys create. Don't forget you can find all the featured W plus 9 supplies at wplus9.com and you can connect with us on our blog at stampawaywithme.blogspot.com. You can also reach us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. Thanks so much for watching guys. See you next time. Bye.